It's Submitting Life with Ty Gay and Chase Hill. What's up, everybody? It's Ty Chase and the legendary Henry Aikens. So, uh, this is going to be an interesting podcast. It's going to be very fun. Yes, very excited. So, happy to have you in, Henry. Thanks, man. You got a good radio voice. <laughs> and <laughs> the legendary voice Henry Aikens. A face yeah. for radio. Um, yeah, so Henry came in and did a seminar at my school yesterday, and every seminar you've ever done uh, for me has been truly awesome and, you know, quote-unquote mind-blowing, but yesterday, I think I even texted you this, but it, man, the way that you changed stuff together this time, and stuff that I've seen for years and years and years, was really, really cool. I love the ping-ponging on scissor sweeps. If you don't think the scissor sweep works... Well, just keep thinking that because I'm going to use it now, and uh, yes. it's it's phenomenal. I loved the uh, the concept that you uh, that you were using right there about how keeping either your legs on the outside or on the inside. I thought that was very interesting too. I had never heard it like that before. Yeah, amazing. Well, I mean, and and that's the thing is like I think once I explain it and then I sh- show why. I think that's the, the important thing is explaining it and then showing why it works the way it works. You know, because people can't pass your guard or there's a certain step that they need to, you need to either clear one leg out of the way. Right. Which basically puts them into half guard each time. Um, it makes more sense for people. Yeah. You know. Very um, good stuff. But I think I think. He, Either Hiron or Henry uses a scissor sweep a lot too. They have a they different do. version of it. They have they a do. little bit of a different version yeah. of it. But um, I think it's one of uh, I think maybe Hiron. It's one of his main sweeps. And yep. I mean, I, you know, it's it's with anything. I think if people are willing to put enough time into the basics, they can get it to work at the high level. You know, right. it can be, become um, a powerful tool for them. Um, but I think most people, what happens is when they start to encounter problems or resistance or they start to struggle with this technique um it's a lot easier for them to give up on a technique and try to find something else um sure yeah i think you know we were talking about that at the seminar like how hodger gracie you know it's just basic fundamentals but he's so good at them that uh it's almost unstoppable i think that's a there's something to be said for that. There's so many things nowadays that people can get kind of distracted with in jujitsu. Like cross collar choke from the mount. I think it was 2009 or something like that that he went, you know, went through the black belt division with a cross collar choke from the mount. That's a, you know, something that we all learn as a white belt. Yeah, like, was like eight this guy people doing? in a row. Yeah, it was That's just crazy. insane. I mean, his, you know, he he's definitely. I think you know one of the obviously the greatest of all time. I think uh, for me, after Hickson, you know, you have Hodger. For sure. Just, yeah, on another level that can basically do what he wants to people kind of at will with the basics, you know, even though you know it's coming, you can't stop it. Yeah, and even after taking true some time skill. off, he can come back and still be just and kill a liar. And demolish the world champion. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty Holy insane. Holy crap. I'm not going to lie. I used Henry's scissor sweep today while I was doing my private. While you're doing your private? Yeah, lesson? while I was doing my private. So with probably a kid, just being no. mean to a child. Yes, all it was. <laughs> I only beat up children. No, but my whole goal was what Henry said yesterday. I just kept my feet right on the outside. I just let him try to run around the guard, and I was just waiting for the timing. I bop, swept him. <laughs> like literally, so it, I literally was just waiting for that. So there was a gentleman there yesterday who uh, he was a purple belt, good purple belt. But you could see like I, anytime somebody has the first experience at one of your seminars, you can see like when the lights go off and everything. It's so fun to see that. And that kid, he. Uh, yeah, he was definitely mesmerized, as were we all. But um, is that I the loved... one that was trying to pass the guard? Yeah, and yeah. I, and I was just using this. Just couldn't yeah. figure out why it just wasn't working like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's so good, so good. Um, yeah. So also yesterday, I promoted my first two black belts. <laughs> this ding dong right here. Uh, this, me? This guy. Me? My, my beautiful wife Jen. She's over in the corner over there. Say hey, babe. Hey, babe. Oh, so nice. You like? I hope that everyone recognizes that. me and Ty are matching right now. Yeah, Twinkies right Twinkies. now. Twinkies. Yeah, we're repping Henry. That's how stuff. we do it? Um, we got to support. Very, we have very a powerful logo. I guess. Percent. Yeah. Henry's actually now kind of look like kind of look like a superhero. I know. With the right? big, a big, a uh, big like logo on your chest. He, he is the first. Who's logo guess. was that? Firestorm? Oh, I think it was Firestorm's logo. I think there was a guy Firestorm. named Firestorm in DC Comics that had, had that, that logo, on the, the atomic logo on his chest. I, I used to collect that's pretty that cool. Comic. Firestorm. Yeah. That's an awesome name. Yeah, that's that's way better than what I would have come up with. Uh, yeah, so it does kind of make me feel like a superhero, to be honest. Maybe it's the jiu-jitsu. I think it's the jiu-jitsu aspect uh, probably of it. something to do with it. Yeah, so um, 
so yeah, that happened. Uh, so now I'm just going to beat the crap out of you guys even yes. more because that's the level you're at now. Yes. <laughs> like, very. Now I'm just going to quit. Now I'm going to turn everything over to you guys. You guys just take over. I'm going to go hang out with Henry on the beach. We're going to quit. <laughs> we're going to yeah. quit. We're going to quit. We're going to go open up our own school now. Me yep. and Jen are. Right across the street. Yep, right across the street. Called Blue Line. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. There you go. Oh, Blue gosh. Line. So um, I have some things I wanted to just to talk to you about. Um, a while back, when you came to do a seminar at my place, you went over and saw my good friend John Bellardo, amazing eye doctor, and he found out that you had a detached retina. Is that right? Detached retina? That was, was uh, that was like eight or nine years ago, yeah, which is it's... crazy. That, that was, yeah, probably nine years ago. And it was the first time I had met Dr. John. Yeah. Um, and what happened was, uh, I think it was Sunday, he he's an eye doctor here in Oklahoma City. Yeah. And he invited me because at the time I wore contacts, he invited me to come to his office before I left the following day, which was Monday, I was flying back to LA um, to just do an eye exam. And you know what, that morning I was really teetering on going because I was like so rushed. I had so much stuff going on, so much mm -hmm. stuff I had to do before I left. I was like, ah, oh, man. And uh, I think my brother was the one that really recommended, hey, you should just go, you know, it's a free eye exam and you, you know, just let him check out your eyes. And Definitely. you know, my brother always gives me good advice. And so, um, so I went and uh, you know, he's looking at my eyes. He said, everything looks okay. And then the last, exam he's doing he's looking at something he goes uh oh something doesn't look good here there's a lot of blood behind your eye and i'm like oh shit what does that mean yeah, yeah. and he's like we got to get you a specialist right away went to a specialist and i found out my retina was detached and uh you know there was a partial detachment it wasn't fully detached otherwise i would have noticed it um and they wanted to do surgery immediately. They were like, w w you got to do surgery right now. And I'm like, I can't. I'm flying back to L.A. right now. <laughs> and they're like, and, uh, you know, apparently once you have this procedure, you're not allowed to fly because uh, they inject your, they put a gas bubble in your eye. And Whoa. so. So the pressure <laughs> of altitude. I flew yeah. back that day, uh, saw a um, specialist the following day, which was a Tuesday. And Wednesday I was in surgery for the detached retina and um, it's a pretty serious issue uh, if you don't have the retina reattached within 72 hours I think you lose vision um, and you know and obviously they want it reattached because you can risk the rest of it kind of coming off and so um, pretty crazy experience man there's there's some videos online if people want to check out what the uh, what the procedure looks like it's a vitrectomy um, how did it get detached Henry I have no idea <laughs> like <laughs> there's, I there's a feel lot like of a common is it common um, you know what there, it, it can be common really? um, and so um, like if you have a much concussive force to your head okay. uh, apparently it's really common with people that like shoot high caliber guns mm -hmm. um, from getting hit in the head you can get a detached retina so I don't know if it's something happened maybe from training throws and doing throws and and you know um, or you know I've, I've you know had a situation one time where I got a thumb in my eye pretty mm -hmm. pretty back uh, pretty far back to the back of my eye could have happened then the crazy thing is I never realized it because um, it was on my left eye and it was the left corner of my left eye, which basically when light comes in your eye, it, it kind of switches it up. And so it was making up for um, the peripheral vision, the right side, the right peripheral vision of my left eye. And so what happened was my right eye was just compensating. And so I could never really, I couldn't really tell unless I closed my right eye. Unless I closed my right eye, I can see like, oh wow, like, my field different. of vision yeah. is is a lot more narrow um but and no, so no pain no no there's no pain, there's no pain? at all and oh so that's God. the thing is you know Sounds it was something that you wouldn't really like for me i wouldn't really know so i had no idea i had no idea how long it had been detached for i had no idea but um yeah it was a it was a pretty crazy procedure and then the recovery from that was uh was pretty yeah. insane talk about that i think that was the most i don't know i was i just felt for you during that period i was like oh i don't know how i would how I would handle that. It was pretty insane because I, I went from living like a super, super active lifestyle where I was training. I was living at a place in, in Santa Monica, which is right next to a kind of a, a popular staircase that everyone goes and works out mm -hmm. at. And it's called the stairs. The Santa Monica and I was, stairs. Yeah, the yeah. Santa Monica stairs. So I was running the stairs every day. I was just super active, super fit. At that time I was training a lot, you know, probably four or five hours a day. And, um, 
the recovery for it is basically, so what they did is they inject a gas bubble in my eye and they sew a rubber band around my eyeball. They oh. basically put a rubber band around, they sew it. Oh my God. Um, yeah, it was pretty crazy. I could feel this, the, the next day I could feel the stitches in my eye. And so the idea behind that surgery is um, I had to lay on my side blindfolded for two months not not really able to move. I could get up I, probably for 22 hours a day. I was basically laying on my side blindfolded. And the reason they blindfold you is they don't want your eyes moving around. And the purpose of the gas bubble, so they stick a needle in your eyeball and inject a gas <laughs> bubble into your eyeball. Oh, my God. Oh. And what that does is it kind of floats and it applies pressure to the area to kind of push the retina and the, uh, and the eyeball back together so it can heal. And... Um, so yeah, I obviously I learned that I'm like, oh wow, this is crazy. So uh, they the the surgery they actually almost pull your eyeball out. They take hooks oh. in because you have four muscles that um, control your eye that basically oh. keep your eye and and help your eye to move. And so they take hooks in and they actually pull your eyeball almost out of socket to be able to get this rubber band around your eyeball. So I remember. Did you the get video of the surgery? Wow. Did they video it? Uh, the, uh, I don't think they videoed it, uh, but there's video. There's video, video footage. People doing it on yeah online that you can did, watch. Did you I go could watch send... this before you? No, knew I, I, was I, I, happen? I didn't watch it before. Okay, I didn't watch it Probably. before. I was, I was probably, just, yeah, smart. it was probably a good yeah. idea too oh because it's it's pr when you're watching it, and I think it's just something when it comes to eyeball and sticking a needle in your yeah, eyeball. Where it, like most uh, people are just like. Uh, you know, it's you can stick a every needle. Horror movie. Every horror movie has a needle. I mean, you stick <laughs> a needle in, in your eye. arm, stick a needle in your leg, no big deal. But when you stick a needles in your eyeball, um, you know, that tends to fuck, kind of freak people out a little bit. Yeah. So um, I just remember waking up the next, after the surgery, waking up and, and just blood pouring down my face because I was laying on my right side so that the bubble could float to this left side. And, um, I just remember blood pouring down my face and I could, as my eyeball started moving around inside, you know, I had, was keeping my eyes closed, I was blindfolded, but you could feel the, the stitches kind of scratching the inside of your eye. It was a weird experience, but um, man, it was, uh, the, the, the recovery was pretty crazy, you know? So two, two months blindfolded, uh, laying on your side. So it really gave me an opportunity to just kind of man, that is crazy. You yeah. know, I've known you for a long time. I knew you for a long time before that, and I, I watched you come out of that a different person. And uh, I guess I mean anybody would be different after that, but I really it changed you in a in a sense of like I saw you more. I don't want to say spiritual because I'm not I'm not really a spiritual person. It's not not really the context I mean in, but it was more like. Um, you had a different lust for life than before. Not that before was bad, but I just saw you come back with a, you had more of a pointed purpose, it felt like, after that. Yeah. I thought that was very interesting. Well, it, it was a crazy experience for me because really, you know, um, I, I was just by myself in this room for, for two months. And, you know, my, my girlfriend at the time would come by at night and, and bring some food over for me. But mostly I was just by myself the whole time and no distractions. Um, you know, you're not able to watch TV. You're not able to look at a phone. You're, there's basically zero distractions. So really it forced me to just sit and be with myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, a, the experience was a blessing in disguise. I would never wish that experience on anyone, yeah. but for me, it was such. A, it turned into such a powerful time because really, I just got to be with myself, be with my thoughts. I started meditating a lot, um, and it's crazy, you know, when you start to really observe your mind and how crazy the thoughts are coming into and out of your mind. So I started meditating. I had a pretty crazy kind of out of body experience one night when I was meditating. Um, which was really, really bizarre and weird for me. Uh, I, I haven't even told many people it, but it was really, really crazy. I kind of felt almost like my body or my spirit or, you know, I don't even know how to explain it, but it kind of come out from my body and start to expand. Mm -hmm. It was a weird, weird experience. But um, yeah, man, I, I, I just spent a lot of time by myself. And during that time too, um, I, I started listening to audiobooks. So I think I went through about 48 audiobooks. Oh my God. Yeah. Within those two months, I just, you know, because I, I couldn't do anything. And so I would listen to audiobooks and I would basically meditate. Yeah. What kind of stuff were you listening to? Like, did you get into any specific you know, genre I would, or topic? Um, gosh, I was, I was listening to all kinds of stuff. I mean, a lot of uh, personal development yeah. stuff. That's always something that's, that's always kind of a, um, 
a passion of mine, something that I'm really, really interested in, just, you know, how to become a better person, you know, working on myself. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to jujitsu, you know, is because, A, I, th I think it really helps develop character, it helps develop the, the person, um, but it also it's something that you can constantly keep getting better at and better at, and I feel the same, same way with, you know, our, our personal life, our, our life, we, like we can keep learning and growing and becoming better, better human beings. Um, and so I was listening to a lot of that stuff, some pretty amazing books. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, it's, we rarely ever get that. I think most of us in life, especially as we get older, become so distracted. There's so much going on. We get so overwhelmed with life. Um, and I would have never had that opportunity to sit and go through all that books and really work on my, the mental side of myself. You know, I was always really developing the physical side, developing the physical side all the time, working out, training. And um, I never really got to focus on the mental side of myself. But that situation really forced me to, to do that, you know. Maybe, was, maybe that's what you need to do to me. Make me hurt so bad that I have to be forced to meditate. So Chase has an issue. So he told me, was it one time that... You're talking about float tank. Yeah, so I was going to go to this float tank thing. And he was like, Coach, I can't do that. I just can't meditate very well. I'll just get bored, start drawing my name on the ceiling and stuff. <laughs> and so slowly but surely, we've been trying to get him to do like five minutes a day with just his thoughts. That's where we're starting at, right? I'm going to try. <laughs> but it's probably very similar to Henry's experience. I've probably been so focused on the all the physical outlets of everything, making sure my body is physically in shape, but not as much yeah. you know, mentally, which it's so I'm important. Really just duct tape you up, put you in the trunk. That's Have you guys you guys have heard of the 10-day the silent meditation retreat? Uh-uh. So yeah. I, I did that um, probably four or five years ago now. It's a 10 day silent meditation retreat. And I had not, I hadn't done any meditation really before that a little bit in my room, but it, it wasn't like a practice for sure. me, you know? Um, and that was one of the most powerful life changing experience I've ever had. Re it's go a, on, tell us more about this. Well, what happens? You just go into a, a place where everybody shuts the hell up. Well, it's a, it's a 10 day. It's Vipassana is the, is the, the method or the, the technique that they use, um, Vipassana meditation. And so uh, it's an amazing thing because um, there's centers all across the world where basically it's a free, it's free. You sign up and for 10 days, they basically provide you with housing and food. Um, and it's all donation based. So after your 10 day, they, they, you know, they say, Hey, if the experience was powerful for you, if you'd like to donate your, you can donate. Um, but it's a, a free experience. And it basically every night you, so you show up and every night they kind of have a, a, a discourse where there's a video of someone talking to you, explaining to you the process, but really you're meditating for like anywhere from like 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day. And, um, it is wow. so crazy and powerful because you really get to analyze your mind and be with yourself and see really focus on your thoughts your sub your subconscious thoughts start to arise and you start to see like wow i can't believe like it's almost like you, you have the experience where you're almost like two separate people there's you who you recognize and then you're, there's your mind that's you know, all of these crazy thoughts are constantly passing through your mind. You're like, why am I thinking that? Like, where did those thoughts come from? And so it's right. almost like you fighting with yourself. It's it's really, really crazy. It really makes you think that, you, you know, made me really realize that you are not your mind. And like, you know, there's two separate things going on in in your head or in your thoughts or, or whatever that, um, you know, you kind of battle with. It's pretty crazy. Where where did you go for that? Where did um, so the center that I went to was in uh, it's in Joshua Tree in uh -huh. California. They have a few different centers in California, but I know they have centers all all over the country um, where they have it. So yeah, you guys should check it out. Think you, if you, you want, for t you think you should, could shut the I hell never up for done 10 it. Days, buddy? So, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I had never I done it before. With that. And it's so crazy because yeah, you're gonna be worse than me. The second day, I I was really thinking like, gosh, I can't do this for ten days. Mm -hmm. I was like in my mind, I was like, man, there's no. What did I get myself into? There's no way I can do this for, because they take your cell phone from you, they take everything, you know, and so oh. you have zero communication with the outside world, yeah. right? And you and then you there's all this stress that builds up. Like, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if you know these people can't contact me? What if some emergency? So. 
you know, you're forced to sit there and deal with all your thoughts. But the second day, I'm thinking, like, what did I get myself into? Like, I'm <laughs> crazy. Like, this is, I got eight more days of this. Like, what the heck? And I could, I was starting to see, like, I can see why people go crazy when they p get put into solitary confinement. Yeah. You know? Uh, and, be alone um, with their thoughts. Yeah, you, you're alone with yourself, right? You got to deal with yourself. And, um, but by the fourth or fifth day, it, I started to let go of all that. And the mind starts to get sharper and sharper and sharper. And you're able to kind of meditate and focus more. Um, and man, it was just like an incredible experience, you know? Wow. Um, that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Also terrifying. Mostly terrifying. Sounds very scary. I, it was one of the <laughs> hardest things I've ever done in my life, and and that's the thing for me. Like anytime I commit myself to doing something, I think like all of us, we want to be good at it. Right. And it was such a struggle the first couple of days because I would literally start meditating, and 15 seconds into the meditation, where you're just focusing on your breath, your mind just wanders off. Yeah. And I, and literally, it would wander off for like a minute or 30 or 45 seconds, and I'd be like, "What the heck? I'm supposed to be focusing on my breath." Yeah. And so I'd bring my attention back to my breath, and then another 10 seconds later, it would just be gone again. Um, yeah. And it was just, so it's so frustrating. And it's so hard to like focus. And I think even in this day and age, like we all have kind of ADD. You know, we're all like multitasking all the time, and like our attention's here, and then our attention's there, and it really teaches you how to like focus and be present. And um, it, it's interesting because I now I kind of think about like when I'm training, um, jujitsu is very similar. Like it kind of forces me to be very present and aware and in the moment when I'm training. Like, so for me now, jujitsu has become kind of like a moving meditation for me where I'm just like really, really present and aware and conscious of everything going on in that moment. So wasn't, you know, there's a famous video, uh, you know, Hickson's choke video where he's doing all the meditation and the, the movement, the, well, the breathing stuff, exercises, the breathing right? exercises. Did you ever get to like experience or talk to him about any of that kind of stuff? Or did he teach that stuff in class or was it like, talk to me if he, you want to know it or, he, you know, he, he would explain what he's doing. He would never, he, he never really taught a class on it or mm -hmm. would teach how to do it. He would explain what he's doing and, and the purpose of it. And, you know, basically controlling his diaphragm and his, his breath and stuff like that and the hyperventilation and stuff. So um, he, he would explain it, but it's not something that he really taught, mm. you know. Do you think it was because he just, he was like, oh, people are here to learn jiu-jitsu. They don't care about breathing or is it, you know, no one. Or was it like a secret trick? Or, or, you know, I, it wasn't, I don't, I don't think it's a trick he because it, he, definitely, just... he definitely, um, he definitely uh, attributed um, his breathing and the breathing technique to you know, a, a part of his success in jujitsu. I mean, um, you know, with his breathing exercises in his diaphragm and, and being able to hyperventilate and being able to control his breath, um, he was able to oxygenate his body. So he would say like, even when guys started to get gas or get tired, he was able to kind of keep mm -hmm. going at a pace for a much longer period of time. I mean, man, back in the day, you, you would see Hickson, he would train for like two hours straight, nonstop with like new guy after new guy after new guy after new guy. I mean, it was just insane, his his cardio base, you know? What year What year did you get to? Like, when were you in the academy training? Uh, 95. 95. Is when I first, yeah. So when was, was Hickson, he was still fighting then? Yeah, yeah. He, had, uh, he had done the Valley Tudo 94. He had done uh -huh. the first one. Um, and then he had just done the second Valley Tudo, which was in 95. So okay. the first two Valley Tudos. And then after that, um, they created Pride. Yeah. And so then he did the Pride fights. Um, and then he did the Coliseum fights. So you know, the, that was the last fight, the Coliseum fight, which was in 2000. Henry's seen some shit then. <laughs> He's definitely seen some shit. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, more than most, I would imagine. Now, here recently, uh, you had a motorcycle accident that scared all of your friends. Yeah, speaking of injuries. Yeah, that was a, I, a pretty crazy experience. And, too. and I made a comment to the person who I was, my partner, when you were demonstrating the moves, you looked fully, I didn't see any glitch in you. There was no... I, I didn't know. I didn't know how well you were me moving. Yeah, surprisingly, um, I healed up really well yeah. from from the accident. Um, Freaking Wolverine! And pretty so amazing for, for the listeners that have no idea. Tell us exactly what happened. So, what was going on? How did so, you, I, I was basically riding riding my uh, my bike um, back. I was going through Beverly Hills, uh -huh. coming back from actually editing videos. I was editing videos that, and I should have known better than to ride it. Um, 
It was nice. It was la- I think it was Labor Day. So it was in September. And uh, no, it was dusk. dusk. You know, it was just getting dark. And um, basically, I was about to enter an intersection and uh, a black Range Rover um, was getting ready to turn. And I slowed down to let them turn a little bit. And then I noticed, okay, well, they're not turning. So I started to speed back up. And about 10 feet before I entered the intersection, they decided to punch it through the intersection oh and so boy. yeah and so uh i saw them start to turn and so basically i just slammed on the brakes and and laid the bike down and i was just praying like as i went down and i went down hit my you know my i think my thumb caught the caught the the handlebar because uh it got ripped off and uh <laughs> it was just hanging on by no like a deal. Ligament. just ripped my thumb off and then uh you know i had like all the flesh because uh-huh. I, I didn't have gloves on. I should have. I should have been wearing protective gear. So that was, you know, my fault and not not being smart, not wearing the gear that I, I should be wearing. But um, tore my hands up and then, uh, you know, I, thankfully I had a full face helmet on, um, because I just remember as I was going down my the the jaw piece of my helmet was scraping on the ground, and it's so crazy because during that whole experience it was like everything was going slow motion. Yeah. And people talk about that a lot when they get into these accidents or get into fights or get into these really, really high, the traumatic, like crazy yeah. traumatic stress, like everything kind of slows down. And that's exactly what happened. Like literally as I was going off the bike, like the thought had come through my head and it was just so peaceful and calm. Like, oh, this is how you're going to die. <laughs> and that was exactly oh the God. thought. This is, wow, this is how you're going to die. And then I hit the ground and I started scraping on the ground and I was thinking, and it was just really calm. And I, there was no pain in that moment. Like, wow, thank God you have a full face helmet on because uh, your jaw would be completely gone right now. Yeah, it would be on it the would ground. Just been, yeah, it would have just been scraped off, right? And um, and then all I know is when I, after I stopped sliding on the ground, um, I just remember saying to myself, get out of the street, get out of the street, get out of the street, you're going to get run over. You know, because there were cars coming up behind me. There were cars moving pretty fast, and I was in the middle of the street. And so I was like, get out of the street, get out of the street, you're going to get run over. And so I, you know, was able to get up pretty quick and ran off to the side of the street. And, you know, when I went to get my helmet off, uh, the whole helmet was just covered in blood. And I was like, oh, gosh, this is not good. Oh, man. So that was my hand, you know. It was just blood just pouring out all over the place. But uh, so, yeah. Yeah, but I that saw was that something like on Mythbusters or something where they did a, a test with people and like whenever you have an adrenaline spike, your brain is actually seeing more frames per second, if you could think of it that way. So that's I believe why it. time seems as if it's slowing slows down, down because you're actually seeing or pulling in more information at that time because everything else in your body is kind of shutting down. It's, it's you know, mm. let's ramp up the processor, I guess, and <laughs> see what we can see. It makes For sense, man. For as long as we can. That's right, yeah. yeah. That, that super crazy fight or flight. And I mean, what's crazy is like, it was so slow motion, and, and I didn't feel anything until they put me in the ambulance. And when really? they put me in the ambulance, all of a sudden, all this pain just hit me and was like, wham. And I was just like, oh, shoot, here it comes. Yeah, and that's when I was Damn. like, oh. How, how how long? I mean, I know you They couldn't get any pain meds in me because my heart rate had dropped so low. Um, oh. You know, so uh, apparently when your heart rate drops really low, they can't put pain medication because the pain med mm. also drops your heart rate, and they didn't want my heart rate dropping below a certain level. Any lower. I wonder why your heart rate dropped. Well, my heart rate would be through the I roof. Think, I, I think I went in shock. Ah. Uh, mm. So yeah. that's what happened. I think I went into shock a little Holy bit. Holy shit. Yeah. How long was it roughly before you even got to get out of the hospital, even start moving? Or, or I mean. So they, they sewed my thumb like kind of back together that night at the hospital, uh, and that was uh, that was pretty fun. They stuck a big, they had to jam a big needle into Another flesh. needle? Yeah. yeah. It was pretty fun. And oh with no God. payment. So they stuck it in pretty deep. And I was like, ooh. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of needles. I am so, not either. So, yeah. But they sewed, they sewed everything back up. They did a pretty good job. The emergency room doctors did a great job putting me back together. You still and have. The doctor actually was pretty surprised that I didn't have any broken bones. They were like, wow, this is incredible. And, I, you know, they, I told them what I do. I told them I do martial arts and I train. And he said, you know, it was probably um, the training had probably helped my body deal, like build up some resilience just from getting thrown all the time. Uh-huh. He's like, man, he said, it's so crazy that you don't have any broken bones. Really? He said, this is absolutely crazy because motorcycle accidents, you know, oh, like this, yeah. it's usually, you know, you're you're pretty tore up. And he's like, man, because I didn't have any protection on. Besides right. your helmet. 
I had a t I was wearing t-shirts and I should have been wearing gloves. I had a t-shirt on and a helmet, you know, some jeans. And um, so that, that was my bad. And, you know, the crazy thing is like, is they always, I'm so careful when I was riding. I was so careful, always like, you know, driving the speed limit, always looking around, paying attention, like very, very, and people always told me, hey, it's never gonna be, you know, it's not your fault. It's not never gonna be you. It's always gonna be the other driver. Mm -hmm. It's always gonna be the other driver. It's not you and, you know, I just thought, no, you know, if I'm really careful, if I'm really, but it's just, it's so true. You can't stop someone from, if they Next want to drive question, into you. question, have you been on that That's, bike since? Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, no, I haven't been on it. And, uh, yeah. Are you, are you I, going to? I won't be riding anymore. You know, yeah. what I realized for me, because I depend on my body so much for work, um, it's just not worth it, right? Sure. It's like we, like even putting on armor, like you don't have, I mean, you know, you have these 6,000 pound vehicles going, you know, X amount of miles. You just don't have protection, right? It's not like yeah, the odds are not stacked in your favor at all. Well, they call them people like they, I guess people that ride motorcycles call uh, people that drive cars cagers or people that are in, they, they, yeah, like you're basically in a cage, yeah. right? And that's, it's so true. Like, yeah, doctors call people that ride motorcycle, uh, motorcycles, they call them, what is that? Organ donors. Yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Yipes, bro. I'm glad you made it out of that one. All right. So, oh, my God. Very, very lucky. And it, do you feel like it uh, messes, with your, messes with your grips or your chokes or anything like that? Yeah, it my, does. I mean, my, my hands and wrists were jacked. I mean, even now, my grip, uh, my right hand used to be my grip used to be super strong. But um, all the, of the tissue in my palm was completely crushed. And um, it literally felt like it literally felt like because uh, from the impact, um, it literally felt like someone had taken a baseball bat and just cracked, you know, swung as hard <laughs> as they can right into my palm. That's what nice. it felt like. So it just do you feel it was mush? Do you feel more of a weakness in your hand, or is it like does it get tired I'm faster? Starting to get, no, I'm it's I'm starting to get strength back in it. So I've been you know working on my grip and working on getting right. strength and doing all of the, like the physical therapy and stuff to get my mobility back. But um, when they sewed it back on, uh, there's a lot of scar tissue in there, so I don't have full range of motion. You're working on that. Yeah, I'm working yeah. on getting full range of motion and breaking up scar tissue and do stuff you, like that. Do you feel fatigue any? Like if you're teaching collar chokes one day, do you feel like, oh man, my hand My grip feels... used to be so strong with my right hand yeah. and, um, and it got super, super weak. Yeah. So I couldn't hold on to things. I couldn't hang from a bar, Yeah. you know? So, you know, going from having like a super strong. Hey, <laughs> what's going on over there? Extra audio coming in from the back. Yeah, going from having like a super strong grip from, you know, just doing jujitsu for more than half my life, you know, it, it did get super weak. But that's, it, it's cool, you know. I, Imagine it, if you wouldn't have been doing jujitsu. I wonder if it would have been even weaker. You might have been dead. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. That's So jujitsu literally saved your life. Probably. I think it had a huge effect in keeping me safe. They see that, you know, I and I'm a big believer in the body always adapts to whatever environment you put it in. And um, I think from just getting thrown, you know, taking impact all the time, having people lay on you, like your body constantly being under pressure mm -hmm. when you're training jiu-jitsu, you always have like another body laying on top of you. I think your body starts to adapt and, and builds up a resilience to it and starts to, you know, get stronger. That's cool. Yeah, I believe that too. Um, man, yeah. Whew. No more gross stories. No more needles in the eyes or ripping my thumb off. We can't promise that. Who okay. knows what we're going to get into? Well, let's uh, talk. We have a few questions. You want to go to those? You got some other stuff you want to hit first? Chase, what do you think? Um, no, we can go to questions. So I've got a friend who's going to be on our podcast coming up, I think, in the next month or so. Uh, Brandon Quick. He runs... Oh. Uh, AGF, this is a tournament that's um, around these parts. It's really all over. I think even in other countries he's running stuff. What does AGF stand for? American, American Grappling Grapple. Federation. He's, okay. he's out of Dallas. So he started yeah. out of Dallas. So they've been coming to Oklahoma City for a while now. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's going to come do a seminar for us, I believe, on April 20th over there at the uh, at the Red Line. <laughs> and anyway, he, had, he was one of the people that asked questions online, and he said uh, he wanted to know um, if you think training in the gi is good for MMA or or street fighting or self-defense what you think it's a tricky question because mm. i i definitely think training in the gi um helps you with grappling okay 
Um, I definitely think it makes you a better grappler training in the gi, um, depending on how you use the tool. I think what happens when you train in the gi is your opponent has a, a better ability to control you because of the grips. And so if you can escape positions even with their grips, with their grips controlling you. Um, so I think it has the potential to help you with your escapes, make it you better at escaping positions. Um, you know, but for MMA, the problem with guys that do MMA is their time is so limited. You know, right. um, guys that are doing MMA, they're, it's not that they're, they're not specialist in one specific discipline. So, you know, most of these guys that train MMA, they, they have a couple hours a week that they can train grappling. They have a couple hours a week that they train their stand-up. They have a couple hours a week that they usually train some form of, like, either judo or takedowns, right? They sure. Everyone trains. I mean, usually with MMA, you think about everyone trains some type of form of grappling. Usually it's jujitsu. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's sambo or um, everyone trains some type of or aspect of takedowns, wrestling or, or judo or whatever, uh, some form of striking, which yep. is like either boxing or kickboxing, right? And then you put in the strength and conditioning too. So a lot of times they implement some type of strength and conditioning program. And so those are, that's a lot of trainings a week. And so, yeah. you know, I think with MMA, people tend to f have the mindset of, hey, I'm not going to be dealing with anyone in a gi. And so you know, they kind of tend to more train for that environment, the environment that they're put in, um, which, you know, I think it's a smart thing to do when you have a limited amount of time. Sure. You know, when you have a very limited amount of time. But, you know, what most people that just train uh, no gi, when they put on a gi, what they feel is they feel so restricted in their movement. They feel very limited. And I think it's always great to challenge ourselves as grapplers to make things more difficult for us. I mean, yeah. it only makes us better grapplers, right? When we when we are able to create environments. I mean, that's, you know, why how Hickson was able to get so good. He was always challenging himself, always trying to make, uh, you know, as soon as he got comfortable, he tried to make things uncomfortable again, try to make situ create situations in his mind to make the training harder for him so that he could grow and, and get better. And so, you know, with uh, you hear that a lot with guys that just train no gi, because with no gi, you can definitely, you can rely a lot more on athleticism to explode out of things, to escape things, to, you know. Sure. Um, yeah, that makes you, sense. You can't get away with that with the, with the gi because there's so much more friction. Right. So when you're training an MMA guy, do you recommend that they do gi training with you, or do you, or if they don't want to do gi, are you just like, okay, well, I'm not going to fight you on it. We'll the, just train what we need to train. Probably just no gi though, right? You probably just say just do yeah. The for thing a is because of their time. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing is the time is a factor. So, and and usually the thing is like when guys are not in a camp, they're not, you know, they don't have a fight coming up. Um, you have a lot more, they have a lot more time to develop themselves, right? But the problem with most fighters is they they want to keep fighting. They want to get the experience. They want to, you know, as soon as they start fighting, they want to, okay, when's the next fight? Okay, you know, I got through they that fight. They finished fight, they want when's to do another fight? Camp. When's the next yeah. fight? When's the next fight? Um, because also, you know, if you think about these fighters is the, most guys have a very limited amount of time. You know, the, they have a very short period of time. You know, usually by the time you're 40, your career is done in MMA. You know, you have very few guys that are still like Anderson Silva. Um, you know, he's still competing and he's in his 40s. Uh, Randy Couture did. But you have very few fighters that are still competing in their 40s. And so usually by the time guys have enough experience or have enough uh, technical ability to get into one of these bigger promotions, you know, most guys have about a 10-year ten year lifespan to yeah. be able to fight. And so, you know, everyone is really trying to, let's make the most out of these 10 years. Let's see how much we can fight. And so, yeah, I think I think um, with constantly kind of going from fight to fight to fight to fight and constantly doing camps, you don't really have that time to like, hey, let's go off here and, and, and you know, try this and just have fun and, and really, you know, train for fun instead of training for a fight. Yeah, so there you get it, Brandon Quick. Nogi is best for MMA and self-defense. I say self-defense lightly there, but I think that, like you said, training in the gi makes your grappling better. I kind of think of grappling as being like the core of fighting, right? Like, so that's the center or the, you know, the very 
the very core. And then you have layers of stuff that's around, like you said, like judo or whatever, or your takedowns, wrestling. And then layers upon that would be like clinching and stuff, and then striking on top of that, you know. So um, anytime you can make any one of those components better, you should. And the only thing about MMA fighters is that it is so limited. There's a small window of opportunity for them in their life to be able to do anything. So unless you already come to the table. Yeah, and they're, very, the and they're very diversified, you know. And so you're also training, I mean, it's hard enough to get good at just jujitsu, right? But For now sure. you have to get good at multiple aspects. And the other thing too that people don't realize, like you can be good at one aspect, but how do you combine them together? How do you, so that, you know, you transition from one to the next to the next. And so there's a few guys that For are sure. exceptional at, like GSP. You know, he was yes, good at he's exceptional at transitioning from the stand up to the, to, to the clinch work, to the, you know, takedowns to the groundwork. For sure. And so you have a few athletes like that. Um, and so that, that's another element that needs to be developed, you know? And so, um, there's different ways to train to develop that, of course. Be curious to see with MMA being around as long as it has been now, you know, kids are probably maybe starting younger and younger, mm -hmm. but it does seem like if you look at all kind of the champions right now, they typically all have a base of some sort. You know, they all started like it was a, they were a wrestler. Rest they were they wrestled wrestling. really yeah. from a really young age, but that's what they that was their, they had one discipline until they got to more doing MMA style. But yeah. I guess maybe that's the only way to do, I guess you kind of have to pick something and start, but the kids are now doing MMA from four years old. Four years yeah. old. I mean, yeah. they're training everything. So at one time it was like, well, I only did wrestling because that was the only thing that was there. Or I only did boxing because that was the only thing they had access to. But right. now with schools becoming more. Well, yeah, because wrestling is available in school, right? Yes. Where, where you don't have, like, boxing is not really available in schools, or yes. kickboxing is not really available in right. schools, jiu-jitsu is not available in schools, and so, you know, you have a lot of these athletes that did wrestle, they wrestled all their life, they, you know, they were in this sport in high school and in college or whatever, and then, you know, you've been doing this all your life, now what do you do with it, right? And so I think that's a, a, a a, a transition for a lot of guys is like okay you know especially a lot of these guys that are accomplished in wrestling or whatever for sure it's a you know it just makes sense oh i'm gonna transition to mma and, and wrestling is a tough sport mma is a tough sport so they already kind of have yeah, that drive we're, we're here in oklahoma so yeah. this is like oh, one, you know yeah. wrestling the, capital yeah definitely yeah well um we've got a guy named brian piccolo that's coming in to do a seminar here pretty soon he is Fantastic and amazing, and uh, we should have him on the podcast and talk about wrestling a little bit with that guy. I just, I, I don't want cauliflower ear in my life. You know, <laughs> seems able to like all the, all the wrestlers it. that I know. It seems like I can see their ears coming before them. But, um, but it is such a great art. Like used to, people didn't look at wrestling like a martial art. You know, I think now they give them more of that. Um, of that credit now because it is a martial art. I mean, it's a combat sure. sport, man. It's a combat sport. It's love you, it. uh, you know, dominating another human being. Yeah, I mean, love that's it. really what it is. Is I, I'm trying to dominate this other human being. I'm trying to, you know, put him on his back and put him in a non-dominant position. And basically, you know, I, I, and that's one of the things is that's that's what really drove me to find jujitsu was wrestling. I recognized, you know. Um, back in the day, how just growing up here in Oklahoma, how powerful wrestling was mm -hmm. as as a combat art. You know, um, I went to to high school in Edmond, and man, I had all of my friends were, were wrestlers, wrestlers, and they were yeah. stud wrestlers. You know, um, we had a huge school. We had a, I had a thousand people in my graduating class, so that's a lot of people to pick from. You know, to 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 form a wrestling team, and um, you know, I saw it was all, the toughest guys always in high school were always wrestlers. Yep. And partially because they were also the most conditioned athletes. But, you know, that ability to, to take someone down, put them on their back where they're, you know, where striking for the guy on their back is really not that effective. Most people that aren't trained don't know how to strike off their back, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're just in such a vulnerable position. Oh, for sure. For sure. Do, do you get to train with any, like, I mean, over your course of your career, is there any like wrestlers or any good guys that you ever really got to train with consistently of that nature? No, I not mean, super, super consistently. Did Hickson ever not, bring any like high level wrestlers in or we had, guys we, in? We had guys with wrestling backgrounds that would come in and train. Uh -huh. You know, they would come in and train. But for the most part, a lot of they either didn't stick around long or they got injured or, or life comes up. And so I, I never had anyone with a, 
like a very, very super strong wrestling background that came in and trained and stayed. That's what's that's what's kind of cool about having an academy in Oklahoma is a lot of times you'll just some guy will come in and be like, oh, yeah, I did some wrestling in high school. And then you grab him and it's like he's been grappling for a long. It's like his little bit of wrestling in high school because everyone does it here. It's yeah, phenomenal it so much. It's like it's, a little goes a long a little way. goes a long way. It's like, man, you just wrestled in high school. He was like, oh, yeah, but I haven't done it in 10 years. And he's over there doing everything like perfectly again. It's well, they have. So, I think with wrestling, you have so much awareness of grappling. Right. Yeah. Um, my my boy Vince, he he did the exact opposite thing. He he had been training jujitsu since the time he was twelve, and when he went to high school, um, I made him wrestle. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, his mom his mom's like, you got to play a sport. And I said, you're you're gonna wrestle. You don't have a choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you don't you don't have a choice. You're gonna wrestle. And uh, so he had never wrestled before. He, he you know first year as a freshman. He's a small kid, and. Uh, when he was training with me, he was always training in the adult classes. And so <laughs> first six tournaments, he pins every single kid. Yeah. As a That's freshman, awesome. he gets put on the varsity team, you know, and the wrestling coach is freaking out like, oh, my God, this kid's a phenom. I was like, no, he's been he's been grappling for the last, you know, right. yeah. four years. But because he's, he's not wrestling. He's been grappling yeah. with, but he's been grappling with adults. Yeah. So Old now you're going to put him against, you know. <laughs> Someone his size. Kids his size, you know, you're going to put him against 113 pounders. Yeah, this is easy for him, you know. That's great. Yeah, that's, awesome. that's fun. So I, I you know, it, it definitely goes both ways. You know, it definitely goes both ways. I think just having that awareness of uh, of how to not allow another person to control your body and how to you know control someone else's body in a grappling situation is so powerful. For sure. Um, when it comes to jujitsu nowadays, do you see like um, where for two two things? How is it different today in today's jiu-jitsu community than it was in, let's say, 90s, early 2000s? And where do you see it going? How do I see it different? I mean, Well, some people now will be like, it's sport versus street and all this stuff. Or it's, you know, no points versus points, IBJJF versus sub only, you know, all this. What do you you think about all that stuff? I mean, the big thing is it's just grown so much. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's grown so much and each individual has their own personal take on what the art should be. Sure. And I think that's why they call it a martial art. You know, you basically learn, um, you know, the techniques, the philosophy and the concepts and everything, and then you kind of make it your own, you know. Um, you, I mean, you're a teacher and you've seen hundreds of students throughout the years and no two students have the exact same game they don't true. you know they don't train the same like some people like triangles some people like arm bars some people have this one choke that they always go for some guys are top players some guys are bottom players some guy has a good half guard this guy's got a good cross so you know i th- i think it's so the main thing i i see nowadays is there's so much variety in jujitsu nowadays there's so many different styles there's so many different schools there's so much information out there that i mean that's the truth that's what's crazy at this day and age people are really spoiled because there's so much information available and easy access to information almost too much it seems like it seems like they're it can be too much and they just so they just turn their little absolutely it can be overwhelming i mean when i you know when i started i had to move 1500 miles across the country to learn that's right find the closest person I, I mean, I yeah. literally moved to California to train with Hickson because there was no one where else I could learn jujitsu. I mean, I could have, I don't even know if at that time if Henzo was out in New York yet. I think he either was or, or had gone out there um, a little bit after. I don't think but, um, Carlos wasn't in Texas yet. No, definitely he wasn't in Texas. Yeah. He was still in, he was still in Los California, Angeles. He yeah. just moved to Texas, I think, shortly after. But um, yeah, I mean, that's. California was kind of the mecca for mm-hmm. jujitsu. And so I had to move if I really wanted to learn it and you know and not learn it from watching like grainy vhs tapes i actually had to go out there and and do it (laughs) i was watching the grainy vhs tapes nowadays i mean there's schools everywhere i mean you know in los angeles just where uh my gym is in la within a two mile radius there's six schools within two miles wow and they're all probably full i mean just a lot of people train there's a yeah. lot of people training nowadays, you know. It's pretty cool. It's pretty it's pretty amazing that there's that many people that are interested in learning um you know, 
jujitsu that are interested in learning the art. I mean, I understand why, of course. I mean, I'm, I was obsessed with it. You know, when I started learning, I became obsessed with it. Same. What did, you know, we got your, we got your brother here, but to, but what did your, well, how did that conversation go with your family when you were like, Hey, I'm going to move. 1500 miles away you broke up with your girlfriend too dude. yeah like, like what like, like, what was exactly. what was your life yeah. like and was like hey i'm gonna move 1500 miles away i'm gonna go learn this art from a bunch of brazilians that no one know. i mean like it's probably sounded crazy to um, your family and friends you know what thankfully my my mom was pretty supportive um because i mean i wasn't doing much here and i knew that you know i it's it's like when you get out of high school, I uh-huh. didn't have um, a very very clear path for myself. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was super interested in science, and I was um, I thought you know okay, well I like science, and um, I was really interested in the field of genetic engineering. Um, you know that's one of the actually the I didn't excel at many classes in in high school, but <laughs> science is one of the classes because I was so interested in it. it was so fascinating to me. I, I did excel in, so I was put in all like honors classes and stuff for science but um yeah my mom was super supportive of me and i was really really grateful for that um you know because i i think she could also see like okay well it doesn't make sense for me to go to school here go to university and waste all this money if i'm not sure what i want to do so um go out and you know in my mind i had always thought okay maybe i'll go and you know learn jujitsu and get a black belt in jujitsu and i can use that as a career but at the time it was kind of it was a thought in my head but at the time so far there was no money in jiu-jitsu yeah. yes yeah. i mean there was you could not make money in jiu-jitsu at all there, there wasn't even a, a possibility because right. the, nobody knew about it at the time you know it was still very very new very few people understood it very few people had heard about it you know um there had been at that time i think two two ufcs maybe uh two or three ufcs it started in 1993 so they might have had but um it was still very very not well known sure you know in the martial arts community people were starting to kind of get woken up to it but I, but there were still a lot of people that had their doubts about it too and that's you know why we like when i moved to california we, there were still challenge matches going on and stuff like that that was like the old school days when guys would you know martial artists would still show up to your gym and want to just throw down so they're still out there still out every there. once in a while. Yeah. Believe it or not, I don't even know. Like, well, there's a video. Still, maybe I don't, they don't have the internet or something. <laughs> Nam just, Pham, just, uh, my buddy Nam Pham just fought a kung fu uh, master at his school. I think it was last week or the week before. Did the guy just come in? Yeah, the guy came in and wanted to spar, and then they end up filming it. And, um, you know, the guy didn't want to wear gloves, so they, oh. they set up a, a challenge match. But uh, apparently the rules of the challenge match was Nam was not allowed to take him down, which is lame. What? Nam is, you know, he's a great grappler, right? He's a very, he's, very, uh, he's very uh, accomplished. He's an accomplished grappler. And, uh, but the guy was like, no takedowns. And so Nam put on MMA gloves. <laughs> Beat the crap just, out of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He knocked him out, like you know, and and oh. the guy, this guy was talking all kinds of smack about MMA, so it still happens. Yeah, I, I it's bet kinda... you it happened. Is he in California? Or yeah, that's in yeah. California. I bet you in California that's still because California has so many people and there's so many martial arts there. I mean, I'm sure there are some people still in their hidey hole somewhere in California some... that they believe in whatever they've been doing and that's what they think. There are some interesting little pockets of m- martial artists. I use that loosely out there. Um, you know, we see this uh, made famous by websites like McDojo and Bullshito and things like that. Yeah, you, you know? still but see videos online of people teaching martial arts, and you're just like, and a whole oh, crowd God. of people that believe it wholeheartedly. Yeah. How That's are these the other people thing. buying into this stuff? Yes. It was just like it's because people sometimes are weak. Yep. Well, people, you know, believe what they're told. They and and they kind of put their trust and their faith in in someone, you know thinking like, okay, this guy's, you know, telling me the truth or, hey, you know, I meet this guy and he says he's been doing martial arts for X amount of years and all this stuff is going to work. That's what this guy told me and he's been doing it. So I just believe him. You know, it's like, there's a part of us too, I think that wants to believe that there's a magical pill to take or a magic bullet or there's some sort of death touch or there's, you know, Santa Claus. There's, there's parts of us that really like to fantasize about stuff and really believe. I think Hollywood Bigfoot movies probably whatever. didn't help either. You know, for sure. like when you grew up Bruce a, a, a Lee watching movies, like Bruce Lee movies, and whatever, even though they're bro, awesome, even like watching for the karate kick, Bloodsport and all those. I mean, the, 
you know, I grew up on all those movies too, and that's really what what got make like made me fall in love with martial arts. Is like seeing like, wow, this one guy can be so strong and so powerful. He can defeat all these other guys. It was it was unbelievable to me. Like that, it's so incredible, right? But when you see those techniques that they're doing in the movies, you're like, and now that you know you. UFC is available and you you watch you know what that's kind of as close to real fighting as you get you don't really see that type of fighting where right. like you know you're doing spinning kicks and guys are getting dropped and then the next guy runs in and it's his turn to get dropped yeah. and then and you're, you know it's a uh, there's 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 still people out there be like oh well I won't ever fight in the UFC because whatever I sh- know is too deadly and I can't you know you, you still hear people say that they say oh and I well, mean okay so I guess you could look at like maybe Headbutting or elbowing, elbowing to the back of the neck and stuff like that. I, but barring that kind of stuff and biting, I guess. No, bro. There's a pressure point. If but I use this pressure point in the cage fight, <laughs> it will Freezes kill you. My body yeah. and I'll be locked here until you unfreeze me. Just biting, like eye gouging, head butts. Yeah, those. Yep. So I can see that kind of stuff. But you know, but people they'll say stuff like, "Oh, well, if I start biting you and eye gouging you," the thing you don't realize is that jujitsu guys could do that too. We just, you know, that's just, but we're just also grappling. We don't have to. That's the thing. So I think that gets overlooked a little bit by people that don't do a grappling art. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times it, it depends on the level of violence you want to take it to. And doing jujitsu, you don't have to take it to that level of violence, right. you know, to really, to protect yourself. Got to be humane, people. Or try to be. Try. Just try. Nice. You got any other? Oh, yeah. Let's see here. Let's go to our online questions Database. here um <laughs> what is the most influential influential thing hicks and gracie ever taught you i'm that's assuming they big... mean other than jujitsu because yeah. that's the big obvious one but did you ever have any gold nugget from him that was like the main thing? i mean you know so many things i mean obviously and I, I think what they probably mean is like if there's one specific thing about jujitsu that really influenced me the most, what would it be? Um, I mean, he, he obviously he's the biggest influence on my jujitsu because that's I of trained course. with him from white belt to black belt. Um, but I think really just his ability to think about jujitsu, how he was able to look at techniques and break them down, um, that helped me so much too because it really um, instilled the ability of self learning. To being able to learn and um, problem solve in jujitsu because jujitsu, I think even Joe Rogan, it's really just high level problem solving, right? Um, sure. We're trying to solve problems. It's constantly solving problems, and so seeing Hicks in, you know, when someone would come in with a new technique or a new position or something new that he hadn't seen before, how he would get on the mat and put himself in this position and and really start to break things down to really try to understand what was going on, what the person was able to do, how they were able to do it, and then start to reverse engineer it um, to be able to either shut it down or defeat it or even sometimes improve it. Um, That was probably the most powerful thing. And so it's, you know, Hickson is is not a huge talker. He's not like a a person. And I I think if you've been to any of his seminars or anything, um, you know, it's mostly in what he does. So I, just being able to watch the things that he was doing was really the biggest kind of teacher for me, seeing how he trained, seeing what he was doing when he was training, um, you know, feeling it for myself too, uh, training with him, you know, so much feeling like what he was doing to me. Um, that was, those were all huge learnings for me. Did Hickson have a, a kind of a right-hand man at that time that was helping him teach? Like, is there another who would who'd be like a training partner that was a huge well, so, influence So in when life? I first started uh, training there in 95, Luis Heredia, mm-hmm. um, who's out in Maui now, Maui, yeah. Maui Jiu-Jitsu, who's awesome, uh, he was Hickson's pretty much main guy. So he was the head instructor. He was uh, the black belt at the school, and he was teaching – most of the, uh, a lot of the classes, there were a couple other instructors. There were three or four instructors that were helping out there, um, you know, all brown belts. Luis had just gotten his black belt. Uh, I think the first time when I had first come out to the school, Luis was a brown belt. And then when I had come back uh, just a few months later, about six months later, he, in, during that time, he had gotten his black belt. Mm. And so he was kind of um, the head he was the one that was basically running most of the classes and, and teaching most of the classes. Then Hickson would come in and teach like one class a day. You know, he had an afternoon class that was uh, at noon that was packed, you know, just, just full. packed all the time. Yeah. yeah. 
and guys would come from all over to be able to train train with Hickson, you know. Did he break it up? Did he have like a gi class, a no gi class, or a valley tudo class? Like, or was it just no, jiu jitsu? How how we trained back then? It was it was we trained uh, in the gi. Always, we there was never there was no such thing as like no gi back then. We didn't even have that term. What we would do is in the summertime we would take the tops off, the gi tops off, and train without the gi tops. But have the pants. Yeah, we'd have the pants, and um, and a lot of times we would train with strikes, you know. And and there were times we would train with strikes even with the gi, you know. And so um, and the the striking that we would do is mostly open palm striking. So we would play open palm and and slapping each other, hitting each other, and stuff like that. So that was really that was common back then so that was and it didn't there was no label on the class that it was all just jujitsu mm. it's nice yeah we have one of those do you still do that uh today is like do you have a specific um time that you make everybody put on the gloves and whatever with yeah I, I have a class once a week that i teach that a lot of mma fighters the, the guys that do mma show up to uh where we it's basically like jujitsu with striking yeah and uh it's such it's it's my favorite class of the week to yeah. teach um because it, it's 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 a it's another layer of complexity on top of just doing jujitsu sure um, there's more things that you have to be conscious of there's more things that you have to be aware of um there's more options for you so it's like when you get mounted it's not just about attacking or going for the neck or going for the arm you can throw punches and then it adds a layer of complexity because now when i start to throw these strikes what is my opponent's reaction going to be and how can I use that to my advantage? And so, you know, as you're throwing strikes, you're creating reactions and it's, you know, so it definitely adds another layer of complexity and thought of like, okay, I just threw a knee. This is what he did. This is how he responded. I'm going to throw that knee again. If he responds the same way, what, how can I use that against him? How can, you know, is it setting something up for me? Is it creating an opportunity for me to catch his arm or catch his leg or mount or advance my position, you know? Every once in a while, just while showing a move, I'll just slap Chase for fun, huh, Chase? He did that a couple weeks ago. <laughs> he looks surprised still. Yeah, I was he, in his guard. Time, I was in still his, surprised. I was in his guard, and Ty was like, okay, we're going to spar with slaps tonight. And he just reached up and <laughs> slapped me. And, of course, then he rolled away, and I couldn't get him back. You know, that's how that works. It's, yes. But yes. We're going to roll slaps tonight. Go. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty much, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, let's see here. Um see Ooh. yeah even during my normal training that's something that i try to stay conscious of even it was even something if it's not strike focused even you're if still there's no striking it. uh, it's something that i like to constantly remind myself of it's like if we were throwing strikes how yeah. could i what could i hit him with how can i hit him sure or can he hit me that's something so like even during my normal training because for me my training my jiu-jitsu was always for that purpose mm -hmm. so i for me i kind of want to make sure that my jiu-jitsu is effective in that environment so i would constantly kind of remind myself like okay if we were doing strikes what would i do right now yeah we'll do some drills where it's like we specifically make it to where oh only one person can strike and the other person can't mm -hmm. so they have those to, are fun drills they, they have to be aware yeah. like you know if it because and the goal is always even the person that's striking is still to use jiu-jitsu we're not trying to TKO yeah, each other, drills. but it's still like it's different. If if you can't hit them back, what can you do? Because a lot of times people also are relying on hitting to get an arm or hitting because mm. the person will block. But like, okay, what if they're just punching me and I can't punch them for whatever reasons? So those are fun drills we'll do too. Well, I've been doing a fun drill here lately where we'll take a tennis ball and we'll have two people be in the guard. And the top person of the guard gets the tennis ball and it represents a knife, right? Yeah, a lot of people die that day, but um, it's a fascinating drill because you see how everybody gets super hyper focused on that ball, and um, and how sometimes that hurts the situation, you know. And uh, the other thing that becomes shockingly obvious is that the biggest hack of knife fighting on the ground is passing it to the other hand. Yes. Mm, so man. a lot of times people go to control that hand, and all of a sudden it's, they mm, switch oh, it. My hand is under control. Mm. No, it's in yeah. my other hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's also way harder to do it with people who also know jujitsu. Yeah. Like it's way harder. Like if I'm trying to control them and they can pass that and they know jujitsu, they know what I'm trying to do. It's it's another layer. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. You get stabbed I love that a lot. Stuff. We try to constantly think of like our foundation of being it's fighting. We're trying to learn how to become better fighters in case, you know, the shit hits the fan. Right. And then everything after that is just ways to sharpen different pieces of our grappling, you would yeah. say, whatever, or our knowledge of 
this grappling or what's I like going to train on, my so. running in those environments. In those True. Hell yeah, my buddy Blake Hayes right. says. Shout out to Blake Hayes. He says that uh, if you're not willing to dedicate um, or to be able, if you're not willing to run a uh, quarter mile full speed, then you're not dedicating enough to your self defense. You know, you're not really serious about self defense if you can't run a quarter mile. And that makes a lot of sense because, oh, I cannot run a lot of people. For a quarter and, mile. And for a quarter mile, yeah. And yeah. that's what I would definitely do. But he was even talking about just even the idea of even being physically in shape enough to defend yourself. Sure. So you like, see a lot you, of guys If you online, can't get up, get down. If you can't get up and off the ground, like if I... to make it. Yeah, it's going to be tough. If you yeah. can't run away, if you can't jump over a fence or do whatever you need to do. Yeah. No. Smart. Yeah, so let's see here. Where do you see yourself... In the next 10 years, what do you see for yourself in the future? future First, plan. let's just, we haven't got to plug your stuff yet. Let's talk a little bit about your, uh, you know, your mind blown club and all your information that you have online now. So, yeah. So, um, I, I think it was about four years ago I started uh, an online site um, because I, I was traveling around teaching seminars at that time. And um, it was organically, I was just kind of, I was, my name was getting out there more and more. Um, and a lot of people had been searching for kind of Hickson's jiu-jitsu or wanted access or wanted to learn like, oh, why is his jiu-jitsu so different? What is so special about his jiu-jitsu? Um, and, uh, you know, so people started reaching out to me because I spent so much time, you know, training with Hickson to, to be able to learn it. And so what happened is guys started following me around to all my seminars mm -hmm. as I would teach. And so I was thinking like, well, how do I make this information more readily available? And so I decided to start the an internet. <laughs> yeah. online site, you know, um, and even though I, I think even back then it was kind of still a little bit frowned upon, you know, to teach online. But um, one of the things I realized is that I could provide a lot of people with far more information than that what they already had. I could still provide people with a lot of value. And so, um, yeah, I started a, a site called Hidden Jiu Jitsu. And the goal for that site really is for me to be able to pass on all of the information that I've learned over the years in jiu-jitsu. Um, you know, pass on the information and the experience because during the time that I was training with Hickson back back in the day, um, what happened with jiu-jitsu is it became very loyal. You know, there's this loyalty base in jiu-jitsu that you can't go and train at other schools. And so, oh, sure, right, there's, there's this huge issue in jiu-jitsu in particular where you know we even have this word called crayonchu which means you're yeah. a traitor if you go train yeah. at other schools so that was not allowed and so very few people actually had access to be able to train with hickson you know um and with him getting older and he wasn't teaching as much anymore um what i saw is like a lot of this stuff that hickson teaches and the stuff that he does which is very I, I think personal to him that the stuff that only he kind of teaches and does um, was going to be lost. And so really my goal was to be able to make sure that I could leave all the information and pass it on to the next generation, pass us, um, you know, on to the jiu-jitsu community. Yeah, it's great. I love what you're doing. I, you know, I've been trying to get you to do that kind of stuff for years. And uh, I know, you know, being a black belt under Hen and Heat on, they got caught a lot of flack in the beginning for having their Gracie University or whatever. But, man, you know, it's about being able to adapt. And jiu-jitsu is all about that, right, is is just being able to adapt. Well, I, you know, so. I think it's a great thing what they're doing. I think the reason they were catching flack was for the promotions, like doing yeah. uh, online belt promotions, which everyone sure. felt was kind of cheap. But, I mean, it's I feel it's a huge service to the community to, to basically put all of this information out there. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, we were talking earlier, I think people are so spoiled now with how much information is so easily available to them like you know people don't understand the sacrifices that i had to make to be your able to entire learn. life you yeah. had to sacrifice your I mean, entire I life my to family, learn my family moved away from, left all my friends you know um moved 15 i mean i was living on 800 dollars a month and then in california yeah, mind yeah. you you know the first couple of years um you know and then you know i would i remember i would go to a place called food for less and I had, f my budget was $40 a week for groceries. Huh. So I would Dang. buy like two boxes here and I had basically the same thing laid out every week that I would buy. And so like these are sacrifices that I had to make to be able to train and, and learn all of this information, you know, sp so I could focus most of my energy and time on training. Um, 
you know, and now this a lot of this information is just so easily available to people. I, th I think sometimes people don't appreciate it as much. It's such a it's such an amazing time to be a student of the art because oh, you can learn from really all of the best teachers have material online oh, wow. now. Before where before I mean, if you wanted to train with someone, I I remember hearing stories of guys driving like fourteen hours just to go to a seminar because someone was in you town. Bet. Yeah, you know, you bet. I mean. People still do that nowadays. I've seen people drive that far for your seminars uh, real recently, like yeah. yesterday. Like yesterday. We had a guy come 10 hours, <laughs> Colorado yeah. Springs. That's oh, where, wow. That's he was Colorado Springs. Awesome. It was about 10 hours. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Some yeah. guys from New Mexico, too. I don't know if you saw them either. Mm, I, I, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, New Mexico. We had New Mexico, Colorado, Kansas, Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Dallas, Texas mm. Houston. Houston. Yeah, that's Houston. That's right. We had a Houston yeah. one. So you have people yeah, from all great. over. I think that's I think that's fantastic. So, well, where do you see yourself in the next ten years, buddy? The next ten years, I mean, I'm still going to be doing jujitsu. You Amen know, to that. I mean, the the goal for me is to do it until I die. I Stay mean, away from motorcycles. Yes, <laughs> that's why I no Please. more motorcycles. And so, uh, yeah, I I you know, for me, it's still training, still um, growing. Uh, I mean, every year I I get better at uh, being a teacher. Um, I develop a deeper understanding of the art, so I'm able to help people better. Um, and I think, you know, I, I had a couple people yesterday that said they'd been to a few of my seminars. I think you, and you said like, man, that was one of the best seminars you've ever taught. And so, for sure. I, and I hear that all the time too, because for me, one of the things is uh, I'm really passionate about teaching and I'm very critical of myself uh, when it comes to teaching. So after the seminar, I always kind of go back and reflect and it's like, what can I have done better? You know what could I have done better? What were there points, or were there, were there was there a technique where a lot of people had questions? And if there were a lot of people that had questions, it means and the same question it means I didn't explain something clear enough. I should have put more emphasis on this because a lot of people were missing that. And so I'm really really uh, analytical of my performance after I teach. And so that's the thing for me, man. I just want to keep spreading the art because it's been such a huge benefit to me in my life I mean it's changed my life it's it's made me such a better person I see it as a tool for personal development and so um for me it's just I feel that's my purpose in the world is just to be able to give back and and to create good through jujitsu you know helping empowering people helping people to become more confident you know get in shape feel better about themselves through jujitsu um and I, you know one of the things I always say is uh the better that you feel about yourself the better that you treat others uh, yeah, right. The more you sure. lo love yourself, the more you can love others. The capacity to love yourself is very, very closely related with that. And so, I think jujitsu really, really helps individuals to be able to do that. To, to, you know, Definitely. love themselves. I totally confidence. Totally right? see that. You can totally see that in people once they start getting that. Yeah. You know, I just recently had a um, a kid. Uh, he was a kid student of mine, but he um, he eventually grew up, and. Uh, in the beginning, when he was a kid, he was kind of timid and shy and stuff. But through jujitsu, you watched him start to flourish and grow and become super confident. And now he's, you know, going to Harvard and all these things. And his dad came in and he's bringing his younger son to me. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm bringing you all my kids. He goes, because I asked Luke, his son, he goes, well, what's your secret to success? So how'd you get into Harvard and all this stuff? He goes, well, dad, you taught me how to never give up. Mom taught me how to read. And Ty taught me jujitsu, problem solving under pressure. And so now he's bringing all the kids in, you know. So uh, jujitsu is so magical true. in that sense about how it's like that one component that can really pull somebody's life together. And you don't have to just be a want to be a UFC champion or a jujitsu champion. You can be just a a brain surgeon. We had a brain surgeon here the other day. It could make anybody's life better. It enhances whatever that you're doing. And I think that really stems from the confidence that it builds. You know, oh, for absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, for those who don't know, I met Henry in the late 90s, and he's the guy who actually started me on my jujitsu journey. And you've never, ever had to be the way that you are with me, but you've always kept me under your wing and always checked on me. And all like, there's a few people in my life that have done that, and you are the one that's done that the most. And man, I just so appreciate you. Like, I was able to call you at any given moment for the last 22, three years. And you were always able to like walk me through whatever I was doing or going on and stuff. And that's, that's, that's really important to me, you know? So I really appreciate you, um, for being that for me, for being that, that guide for me. And also for being there while I promoted my first two black belts. It was, uh, that was, was really, a pretty really awesome special. Day. 
It was super special. That was a pretty so. awesome day. That was one, actually one of the proudest moments of my jiu-jitsu career, which uh, it was not long ago. It was actually last summer. I promoted my first two black belts. That's awesome. And um, I didn't expect to have the experience that I did. I mean, I almost was in tears because it's it, it's really like, you know, you're passing on your knowledge to the next generation. You're creating these black belts that are now, you know, are going to go out and, and spread your message to the world you know it, it was a it was such a powerful experience for me and it was something that i'm i'm really really proud of and so i i kind of was like as you were doing it, i was like oh man i know exactly how it's been <laughs> yeah it was almost as uh powerful as the moment when i received my own black belt i would tell people yeah man they, yesterday was a little bit different than today because yesterday i was just trying to be focused and get things done and whatever and, and then after like last night and today i was able to reflect a little bit more about it and stuff and yeah it's one of the um one of the greater accomplishments of my life, if not the greatest. So, super proud of you guys for, you know. Hey, I'm gonna not jump leaving. out real quick. I'll be Do right it. back. Do it. We'll have some air. Yeah, so, speaking of teaching, I'm just gonna have you teach all the classes from now on out. I'm just gonna come from in and sit on? like Hickson. So Hickson can just come in and just cool. like sit in one cool. class or whatever. I'm, I'm teach the, a class at noon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just teach. I'm gonna be teaching the, noon classes, y'all. The perfect y time to teach a class at noon, yeah, right? Yeah, good. Yeah. I think that noon classes are the best. Do you know why? Because you teach them. Because I teach them. Yeah, how did you know? Because I know your schedule. I run your school. <laughs> well, kind of. Hey, Matt, what's up? Hey, look, it's Matt Aikens. Matt Aikens, bud. Say something on the on the mic. Very happy to be here. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good night. No, uh, no. This is a blessing in disguise. This was, it was, it was cool. What a great weekend. Yeah. I've had a lot of fun. Probably more fun than I should have be allowed to have it's fun talking to people it's friends i love it he Sweet. had to go he had to go it was bad yeah hey so you know if you do joe rogan which i plan on you doing sometime soon you're not going to be able to go pee without them giving you f lots of flack oh yeah yeah so no, start working on that bladder control buddy i should have done the restroom break before <laughs> yeah well for when he goes on rogan he has practice now see there you go you would go on rogan right I've yeah. heard different things about different people mentioning you on there. Yeah, the lot so. of people have mentioned you on there. A couple of people, yeah. yeah. A couple of people mentioned you on there. So Come on, hey. Joe. Let's Get do him. this. Get Henry on there. What you Henry, you talked about when you were starting all your online stuff. Is there one specific either person or push that pushed you to do the online? Like you said that people were kind of following you around. Like who how did people start really hearing about you? Was it just like you did one seminar and then like two people showed up and you're like, hey, you're at my last one. Then like four showed up at the next one. Yeah, you know what's interesting is um, what happened is I actually had a guy in Kentucky reach out to me uh -huh. and he said, hey, you know, I've been wanting to, he, he did some research online and heard that I trained with Hickson and was really looking for someone to be able to teach him Hickson style. And he was like, called me up and he was like, do you know that? He actually reached out to me, on, I think on Facebook and he was like, hey, do you know that stuff? Do you? And I'm like, yeah, of course I, 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 <laughs> I hope so. I like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, he invited me out to teach at his school. And at the time he had a, a really, really small school and, uh, you know, there were a couple black belts there. Um, it was him and a couple, I think there was like, maybe, maybe there was just like one other black belt there. But what happened was after the seminar, he was just, you know, and that's why I use that term mind blown. His mind was just completely blown. He was just like, holy cow, I can't believe this. He was like, because we covered, uh, I remember at that seminar, I covered just some basic techniques, but like little variations that we were doing that makes the techniques a lot more efficient and effective. And he, you know, his words was like, man, I've been doing this wrong all this time. And it's not necessarily wrong. It's just there's a better way of doing it, right? So what happened was he literally, after the seminar, was calling all of his friends, all the guys that he used to train with. And he's like, man, you got to see this stuff. It's so incredible. It's so amazing. It's just 10 times better than what he was doing before. And so the next time I came out, there were like five or six black belts there. Mm -hmm. Taught that seminar. And then those guys were completely like just freaking out. And they were like, we gotta have you to our school. And so that's kind of how it grew. And so they invited me to their school. Those guys were freaking out telling their friends and it just kind of grew and grew and grew from there. And then um, what happened was some a couple people did some write-ups after attending my events, like articles, of their experience, some articles started interview. coming out and some, you know, like, wow, I just attended this Henry Aiken seminar and, you know, and they, they kind of shared their experience. 
And so everything was really, really organic, you know, how, how that kind of grew and grew. And, um, and then people started really kind of, you know, opening their eyes and seeing, awesome. wow, they're, well, all these guys are saying that it's different and it's, there's something else going on. So I think it piqued a lot of interest. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. Um, yeah, and I see a lot of those guys, I'm friends with a lot of the same people that you are on Facebook and stuff, and I see them um, taking the techniques and using them and even competing in IBJJF. Dan Hart, like he just competed in some IBJJF stuff. He's yeah, killing he just it, you know? took silver in the pans. Yeah, yeah. it's freaking great. And it's funny because he said, uh, he said one of the guys that he beat came up to him afterwards and said, I can't believe you beat me with that white belt shit. Oh. <laughs> you know, oh, made like, you proud, <laughs> which is kind of funny, yeah. right? It's, I, like, yeah. I can't believe that you, you like all these basic uh, brown belt level. You think that stuff doesn't work anymore? It's just yeah. like, ha <laughs> ha, kind of funny. Yeah, it, that's it, funny. Yeah, the best quote is that was the quote of the week. I can't believe you beat me with that white belt shit. And, <laughs> uh, so Dan posted that, and some of the guys in one of my private groups. We have I have a couple of private groups for my uh, content. Um, you know, all the guys are posting white belt shit for life. Yeah, you know? that's right. T-shirt, please. That's right. Henry Aikens. That's great. Well, man, I um again, uh, thank you so much. You know, this is the you're the first person to do our podcast twice, right? Yes, he's the first one to do it twice. Yeah. Yeah. See, you so, like it? Yeah. It's great. We're uh, we've upgraded a little. We've so upgraded this, a little. This bit. is pretty great. Um, so, um, hopefully, we'll just keep on uh, do, until I get to the island. You know, some just podcast from my personal island. Personal island. It's going to happen. Just wait. Henry, where can they, where are you going to be next? Where are your seminars going to be next? Uh, so next weekend, I'm going to be in Maryland teaching a okay. super seminar at um, Stewart. Mike yeah. Stewart's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you've been doing an event at Mike's. Oh, yeah. I love him. He's one of my good friends, man. He, uh, and he'll pack he's the crazy, house. but he'll, I love him. Yeah. I love you, Mike. He'll pack the house crazy. for you. So Jeez. I'm super excited about that. Yeah. And so, we're covering four, four different, um, four different kind of positions or, or concepts or ideas uh, throughout the weekend. So he has a bet with you, I heard. Yeah. I heard he has a bet that you can't tap He up you know, he made side. this bet up. It wasn't it wasn't uh, me. This is the worst bet for And it Mike wasn't ever. from it wasn't from cross sight, it's from scarf hold. Oh my, oh my god, that's even worse. God, why would you ask for me to put you in scarf hold? That's like So the bet is this. Mike has a big long beautiful beard and so if Henry can tap him from uh, he threw that up hold. out of nowhere. It was <laughs> just like I bet, he did it like in a live video too. Yeah. Just like came up with it. His only uh, his only stipulation is you can't shave a Hitler mustache on him, which is fair. But yeah, um, you could do any beard. other pattern that you want. So you should really put some thought into this. If I can tap him out from Scarfold, he's yeah. I get yep. to shave his beard. So oh, you should know, just shave got, half of it. I got I got a week to start to come really creative. Handlebars, yeah. so you know, something. Yeah, something. You got to make it something crazy, and he'll do it. He's totally down. I'm going to shave some unicorns into him. Uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> he's a good some dude, rainbows. man. He, uh, he's a, um, he's a jujitsu mogul in my opinion. He's uh, very good at marketing and very good at structure and stuff. And he's helped, mm. he's helped me out with a bunch of stuff. I, I really love that dude. Shout out to you, Mike. But yeah. Um, yeah. That's going to be an awesome seminar there. It's a huge place. His school is it's, massive. It's big. Columbia, Maryland. So I'm super excited yeah. about it. I'm super, super pumped. It's the first time I, I I've, uh, ever gone out to his school yeah, and so great. and it's the first time I'm kind of doing this format too where I'm doing four uh, four events in two days yeah you know yeah stacking That's yeah right. drink and lots all, of water all of the all of the 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 ideas that we're covering or the topics that we're covering are, are completely game changing and so that's the thing for me is like man we're covering cross site escapes guard passing uh, scarf hold and submission escapes and defenses and each one of those by themselves is just like game changing and so we're covering all four in one bring a notepad like, people i hope i hope mike maybe two notepads i hope mike attends the scarfold seminar because <laughs> he'll need it after yeah after you smash him so that's the thing i'm wondering when when do i get to put him in right scarfold? the beginning is it before, right the beginning. Right hopefully is it yeah is it before i, I teach hope. the scarfold seminar i would so hope he just has no idea he has he's zero just not idea. prepared that's what you need to do that's what you should make it all right we'll you see. control we'll the bet yeah, that's right. <laughs> Are you, so you're gonna, three black belts right here. We just made a decision. Yeah. He's a he's a brown belt. He's a brown belt. See, we matter. just pulled rank on you, Mike. It happens before the seminar, buddy. Mike, even or. though they say they're your friends, they're not really your friends. <laughs> <laughs>
That's right. So well, you, you'll be you'll be in Maryland, and then any do you have anything else on the books after? Um, I have a ton of events coming up throughout the year. Okay. Um, so uh, is there a best place they can look at all of it? Yeah, hiddenjujitsu.com. dot com. Okay. So I have an Boom. events uh, an events section, upcoming events, upcoming. So um, and it lists your there. tour schedule. Yeah, so it's gonna. gonna um, I'm 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 updating it all constantly, and that's the thing is like there's new seminars that come up all the time for mm-hmm. me. Um, usually what happens is school owners will like hit me up and invite me out and we'll just pick a date and make it happen. You know, yeah. for me, um, I don't have any type of affiliation or anything that where, so I, I teach at any school, anybody that wants to learn, I'm open to teaching them, yeah. you know, and that's kind of how, how my philosophy I think that's has a been. really cool uh, yeah. business model. Yeah. I really like that idea. Well, I, I mean, I see like everyone that does jujitsu for me is one big giant family, I agree. you know? 100%. And so, uh, I'm, I'm here to teach whoever wants to learn. And so, yeah. Any any social medias or anything you do that they can find you or follow you at, or do you? Um, you do your Facebook. Thing, Facebook. But Facebook. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I got to get better at my Instagram, so that's something I'm working on. But usually uh-huh. Facebook. Follow me on Facebook. I have okay. um, you know a, a hinge jitsu page on Facebook, uh, and then also I have a fan page on Facebook, and then my personal page. So. Okay. And all of my seminar information gets shared on there too. So. Perfect. Sweet. There you go. Well. Thank you again for being here and gracing us with your presence. Second time on the Submitting Life podcast. Oh, yeah. First of many more. That's right. First of many more. Great. All right. Wonder Twins. Let's go. <laughs> Powers unite <laughs> in the form of Guy. Uh So now we're going to go shoot some videos, right? And then maybe go eat? Yes. Uh, I like food. food. Is good. <laughs> what time is it? Ooh. Yeah, we went way over. <sighs> Just kidding. We have no set time limit, but. It's all right. I like, all right. I like to just get it in and out fast. Done. Quick. All right. You want to send us off? So we appreciate you. If you like what you see or hear, <laughs> please follow us on or follow us. Go to Patreon. Patreon. Uh, and Patreon. Yep. Patreon.com slash submitting life podcast. Yeah. We have extra stuff and things that you can uh, shenanigans. Basically, you can yep. see this stuff sometimes live behind the scenes. Early access to episodes. So there's some uh, videos of chasing the tutu. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't remember yeah, that yeah. one. It's, it's a special, uh, it's a special um, package event. <laughs> what package is that? The wrong package. All right, we're out of here. See ya. Peace. Bye.